I think a lot of people know that I started off on Wall Street doing this job. I was a lawyer, and I, I didn't love it. It was fine. Um, I enjoyed parts of it, whatever. I went to law school for a similar reason. Like Such a diplomatic way to describe the career that you did not want to do at yeah, all. Yeah, it was fine. It was fine. I liked parts of it. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of true, right? It like wasn't I, for you. I liked my coworkers. That's you know? true, yeah. I liked uh, working in New York. And that's where you, And that's where you found out that you were really like interested in networking and relationship building. Yeah, that's right? true. So there was, yeah. uh, was an important phase for you from what I understand. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And prior to that, I was in law school and I was learning about networking and relationships that then transitioned to this dating thing, which resulted in these conversations with friends at bars, which then resulted in starting a podcast. And so that's when I found, look, I'm really interested in broadcasting, I'm really interested in interviewing, I'm really interested in all of these different facets of getting people's stories and teaching and all that stuff. And that turned out to be, and I love using this cliche, this turned out to be kind of my purpose or my calling or my main raison d'etre, I guess you could sure. say. Sure, yeah, your passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm try I've tried so hard to avoid that word because it's overused, it's beaten to death. It's a little bit, yeah, trite. But, but yeah, that is right. what it is. It's, it really is. It's purposeful and it's passionate work for you. It, it yeah. is. And I, I, I think about this a lot. I was just uh, on a trip to a maximum security prison with a bunch of other entrepreneurs. And I know these guys and gals really well. But it's a little bit like you get this tug at your logical brain, I guess, because people are like, who are my age or younger are like, yeah, I've just, you know, raised $30 million for my 13th company. And I live like other buddy of mine's like, yeah, I have this massive supplement brand, live in Panama. Like, you know, they're very, very wealthy people. And I'm like, okay, well, we're probably equally smart, capable people. If I just focus and give away 10 more years of my life to this other business, I'd be super rich. And I'm like, but I like doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, this is the thing. So that's how I know that, yeah. that, that this is, that's one way that I know that this is my, my thing. You mean because you're willing to put in the time to build it, even though it's not gonna make you live in Panama and have right. tens of millions of dollars tomorrow? Right, like, yeah, like there's a, my, like, you know, I talk to my buddy New who owns like utility companies in Thailand, basically. Mm. And you, you talk to these other guys and they're like, yeah, I have a $1.3 billion private equity fund. And you're just like, wow, you know, that's incredible. But I'd rather do this which is a little psycho when you put it at, like when you put these things next to each other, it's crazy. It's like, what are you doing? You know? Well, that, but that's the power of doing something that means something to right. you, right? That you're in a way, and it sounds so, this is also a bit cliche, but it's cliche because it's true that you would do it even if you weren't getting paid. Right. Like if tomorrow somehow this didn't net you any money, I know that you would still be on the phone talking to people being like, yeah. how do you, how do you read a book? Right. Or like, yeah. what did you do when you were at the bottom of your journey and you yeah. climbed back up? Like, that's part of your DNA. It's purposeful. Yeah. yeah. So I think what you were probably driving at is like, okay, so you shifted from Wall Street where it wasn't purposeful right. and you shifted into something really meaningful and then what? But also it's really hard and demanding. Mm. And that's kind of the problem is people, often people will go, you know, when we had to switch from the old business to the new show, people were like, you know what, maybe you should just do something else. You're really smart. You could do this lucrative other kind of business. You could do this online marketing. You could do da da da. You could be making $10 million a year uh, or more. And, and I'm just like, nah. <laughs> you know, like, no thanks. It. Yeah. And it wasn't like out of fear. I don't want to do that. It's unknown. It was like, no, I'm really liking this. And it's not like I can't put food on the table doing this. You know, there's a lot of amazing opportunity that comes from it. And we did an article about finding your purpose or finding your passion, and that was really popular. And this is kind of the next beat on that, which is what happens when it gets hard? What happens when you wake up and you're like, my voice hurts, I'm tired, I don't want to do the show, i got to read this stupid book, I don't want to read it, and I'm not even interested in this anymore, and I just want to go to Taco Bell and like fall asleep. Yep. Or whatever you when fall asleep I, on a lot of Taco Bells. I not not in. I meant go to Taco Bell, get food, oh, eat it, home, and then go home and, and fall, then fall asleep. asleep. Yeah, sure. just, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> not like walking through the drive-through on foot after three beers yeah, and yeah, then yeah. like laying down in the parking lot. For a second, I thought I was like getting a glimpse of what like uh, like sad, difficult job Jordan was. Like. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. falling asleep in a Taco yeah, Bell. Like, <laughs> yeah, like Pollo Loco, walking in, set your stuff down, put your head down, and go to sleep. I mean, I've definitely thought. I mean, about we've all. Falling asleep, yeah, in a few weird places for sure. But I think, yeah, absolutely. Like, 
that what's so intense and important about this topic is that we are all here to find our purpose. And one of the things that you and I talked about in that other episode, and by the way, I highly recommend you, guys, recommend you guys go and read the the previous article. And if you'd like, listen to the deep dive because it was very personal um, yeah. for both of us, I think, because we both made the transition from the corporate world into work we really care about. Right. And you know, whether it's a job that fulfills you or a calling that compels you or a craft that inspires you and whether it's your family or your friendships or your, your art or whatever, wherever you derive your sense of purpose, it doesn't matter. But if you're getting that source of meaning, there will always be a point where your passion, your calling, your purpose, whatever you want to call it, gets hard. Mm -hmm. It always gets hard at some point. And the more intensely you pursue it, the harder it's going to get at some point. And I think what's really difficult for anybody is knowing that you are pursuing something you actually care about. And by doing that, setting yourself up for frustration, yeah. disillusionment, heartache, because as soul crushing as a meaningless job can be, and I think we both felt that in our previous careers, sure. you know, it's a part of your life. It isn't your life. And a purposeful job in many ways can be more painful. Exactly. Like I know if I was still a lawyer right now, I'd be like, oh man. I don't know about this work. I wasn't doing meaningful, I wasn't a public defender. I wasn't a pro or a prosecutor. I wasn't like an advocate for the downtrodden or pro bono. I was doing like financial transactions. You're like white heel, is yeah, that the right, yeah. white glove? White shoe. White, white shoe, shoe, yeah. White glove. White shoe is it? It's always shoe and glove, it's not heel. White glove, I think, is just like a fancy butler handing you something, maybe. I think white glove means like, it's very hands-on and like high touch. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But white shoe means... White shoe is what you were doing. You, I don't know, you trample people with that gen tender loving care? Did you ever wear know. a white shoe at the law firm though? That's Not nice. as that. Yeah, you firm. probably wouldn't... It was a little pat, maybe it was a little gauche shit by Bold then. move yeah. to do as a young analyst. Yeah. Anyway, continue. You were doing financial transactions. So, so yeah. I, if I were still doing that, I'd probably be like, oh man, I don't love this. I mean, I personally, I would be gone by now, but if Jordan Parallel Universe version was still doing it, I probably wouldn't love it, but I'd be like, eh, okay, I get it. But I'm not like, I wouldn't be like, I'm gonna be the best at this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be passionate enough about it to be like, I'm going to be the best derivatives, blah, 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 the best financial transaction, mortgage-backed security, whatever. I wouldn't care. So if somebody else was like, I'm the top litigator in the tri-state area, I'd be like, whatever, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But now with interviewing, podcasting, journalistic pursuits or whatever i'm like this is this has got it this is important this means something and, to the, me, yeah. and it means a lot and the problem is then you get people who come into the space and you have to i have to sort of like throw cold water on my face because i'll have a friend of mine like tom bill you come into the the niche and i'm like wow he's doing really well and i have to be like this is good for everyone and i I, I'm friends with him, so this is good, right? Instead of being like, oh, comp competition, gotta be ruthless. You know, I, it means more, so I think about it more. And also, the downs are more miserable. Like, if you lose, there were stories of people losing their business uh, yesterday at the prison trip, and they were like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna start over, I'm gonna pivot, pivot I'm gonna do something else. I know when we had to switch to the new show, it was like loss of identity and like all this crazy, horrible things. But when someone gets fired from working at Deloitte and then they go to Accenture, they're probably like, wow, that was traumatizing. Glad I'm whew, landed right. on my feet. Right. They're not like I'm having still, nightmares. I'm still a consultant. Nightmares. I still have a connection to right. my skill. Yeah, totally. Yeah, or yeah. they're like, ah, oh, this is good. I'm gonna start my own shop now. When your passion yeah. gets tough, your entire life your choices, your values, your sense of self get, takes a hit. Right. It's not just your your financial situation or your job title or like, oh, I really wish I had that business card. Exactly. That's what happens when, when work is just a part of your life, which is fine. But I think it's important to recognize, yeah, when you pursue your purpose, it's a different game entirely. Mm -hmm. your, your emotional life is different. So how do you keep going when your purpose starts to suck? Right. Like, what do you do when the one thing that gives you meaning also makes you miserable. Yeah. And the first thing I think we should start talking about today is like knowing that purpose is not the same as happiness. Meaning, doing something meaningful does not automatically create joy. And happiness isn't required to create meaning. Meaning and happiness are two different concepts. I think that's really important. I want to, it bears repeating. 
if you are doing something meaningful, it does not necessarily mean you're enjoying it every day. Like someone asked me yesterday, wow, you really love interviewing. I can just tell, I listen to the show and I'm like, yeah, I do, I love it, I love creating the show. And I go, it doesn't really feel like work. But then I kind of caught myself and I was like, no, there are so many times that it feels like work. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel like work, but when I'm like sitting on a plane, lugging a 58 pound case of crap around with yep. a backpack on, yep. And like you're not like this is so purposeful. This is so purpose. I'm so much meaning is being derived from this, right? You know, or I'm like reading a book and going, oh, I shouldn't have booked this person. This is going to be craptacular. Or looking at the bedside table and there are four more books that you have to get through, yeah, so that you can do your interviews the right way. Right. It's Saturday night. I haven't taken a weekend forever, and I've got to finish 18 hours of work and then roll into a five day business trip. I'm not thinking about the meaning derived from said preparation, yep. but but I still do it. And I kind of, if someone said, what would you rather be doing right now? I'd be like, well, I would doing this. I just don't like it. <laughs> it's like, and probably- that is, Wait, that is what you just articulated is such an important part of meaningful yeah. work. Like, no, I wouldn't do anything else, but this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> is how a lot of purposeful people feel a lot of the time. Right. But like, you don't realize that when you're thinking about making the jump to pursue your purpose. No. Why? Because every blog and every podcast and every motivational porn YouTube video right. is like, make the leap. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Every day will be this like orgy of purpose. Right. And it's like, no. Here you are it's on the beach. It's not like that. It, there's a common sort of entrepreneur joke where we see that motivation porn. We, no no like successful entrepreneurs actually watch those those stupid Instagram Except things. Except probably a handful of times to be like, these guys are ridiculous. Yeah, they're like, the what hell? is this moron? Yeah. And and we see that there's like a, always a cliche couple of things. One is a guy standing on a beach with his arms in the air, like, yes. Yeah. And then <laughs> another one is a dude's feet with like a laptop out and looking at the ocean. Right. And so people look at that and they're like, whoa, working on the beach. Da -da -da. And we always kind of joke like, Oh, he took the picture where he gets to go look at the water for five minutes during his beach vacation because he's got to go back inside soon and finish his job. Totally, sure. yeah. At best, he has to like go back to the small room in the hostel, right? And like do fulfill all the dropship orders, right? Whatever. Hammer out those yeah. customer service requests totally. or whatever. Yep. Yell at his team, and then like the the laptop on the legs picture. We're always like, look at this poor sob checking his email at the beach because he's got no time. You know, he's got three thousand incoming requests, right. and so it means something different to somebody who's sort of been the game but yeah people go oh well what would you do different yeah i'd be doing this but i don't like it yeah i do this but in greece <laughs> you know, right. i'd be reading this crappy terrible book yeah. and using a dead highlighter right. on a beach right. you know it's right. just ridiculous right. so the meaning is very very divorced from the happiness part it is i mean they're closely related and they do line up from time to time and i'm i don't think we're saying that you can't pursue meaningful work and be happy that's not the case no but there isn't an automatic relationship between the two. It's not like one guarantees the other. In fact, I would say that's quite the opposite because pursuing something meaningful usually means pursuing something difficult. Right. And if you're gonna pursue something difficult, it's going to be painful at some point because meaning is hard to come by and it's correlated with the amount of energy required to master the craft or to fulfill the goal or to service that customer in the way that you wanna service them. Like, Solving a difficult problem or pursuing a gnarly goal sounds romantic, mm -hmm. but on a day-to-day -day level, it's usually pretty daunting and demanding. Yeah, and, and honestly, it's it's kind of like, this is what I always assume writers are talking about. You never read those old novels where, or like memoirs of, I don't know, probably Bukowski or something. It's like, writing is horrible, it's a disease, you know, and you're just like, geez, who would ever do this? Right. That's what they're talking about, I think. Yes, They're like, 100%. the reason I go to this cafe and drink this, coffee and like drink myself into a stupor by 9 a.m. so I can type on this typewriter or whatever they're doing for yeah. their latest novel yeah. is because it's meaningful. Yeah. They're not like, I just love being a completely dysfunctional human being no. and like but they're, they're medicating because this is the only thing that they feel like is worth doing. Totally. For them in Absolutely. Their whole life. Yeah. Why else would they do it? By the way, nice, great way to perpetuate the myth of the drunken writer at the typewriter. But I know, yeah, right? But it is, a, it, is, it is a trope because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Bukowski is a perfect example. But yeah. like, yeah, they'll all, every good writer at least will tell you that the glamour of writing comes down to like painstakingly obsessing over words and sentences right. for weeks on end. Like, Maybe months, usually years. Like, it's not glamorous. No. It's glamorous to be at your book party. 
It's glamorous to be interviewed because you wrote a book. Those things are fun. But there are years usually of yeah. of development that are really unpleasant. So yeah, I was, uh, I was actually talking with Mark Manson, author of Soul Art of Not sure, Giving a yeah. Fuck, and his new book Everything Is Fucked. Of course, rolling with that theme, yeah. and we're friends, so I ask him all the time, like, "Hey, how's the book with Will Smith going and stuff?" And he's like, "Well, I mean, aside from the crippling anxiety and the fact that I'll, I'm working with somebody that has impossibly high standards and is like richer than all of my friends and family combined, and like." you know, expect all this crazy. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's not just like every day kicking it with Will Smith and like being being fun. Right. He's like, no, not really. I mean, he's loving it, right? But not because of the wild thrill ride that is every amazing day of typing out this book. Yep. It's like, it's a unique experience that's life-changing and interesting and fascinating, but being told, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you fly to the Cayman Islands and like, work really hard and cancel everything else that you had to do because Will Smith has three days off and this is like your job now. Exciting, but maybe not always super, super fun. Not at all. If you pursue your purpose, you will be miserable yeah. from time Fact. to time. <laughs> and if you're doing it right, you probably should be in the sense that if you pursue your purpose fully, you're going to expose yourself to experiences that produce unhappiness a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So that could be criticism, that could be feedback, that could be rejection. Usually it will be all of those. It things. will be all of yeah. those things at some point, but usually it's just the technical difficulty of the thing that you're trying to master. Mm -hmm. You're trying to find out how to be the best interviewer possible. Right. You're trying to articulate somebody's vague life lessons into a really beautiful book. Like mm -hmm. those are hard enterprises to do. And if they were easy, a lot of people would do them and everyone would be happy. Right. But they're not. Everyone is not happy because everyone is not trying to do them and everyone can't do them because the craft is difficult. So it's almost like passion and happiness are negatively correlated a lot of the time. And I, yeah. I know that's a buzzkill and I'm not saying that you can't be happy and do purposeful work. That's not what we're saying. But the more passionate you are about your purpose, the more likely it is that that, that purpose will will produce unhappiness at, at some point. And if you if it doesn't or if you refuse to believe that, then I think we start to perpetuate that myth that purpose automatically equals happiness and it's that myth that makes us so upset when the craft gets hard because we're not prepared to right. push through when the purposeful work becomes difficult yeah yeah good point so like the more you want to win the more it hurts to lose right because your expectations are are high for yourself for the project you've got you've got all these expectations of like i want to be th there now you want to rush the process or maybe you don't even know what the next steps are. It's kind of the story of my life right now where it's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I have all these options. Cool. How are you going to do that? Which one are you going to pick? Oh, I don't know. How are you going to get to that one? Well, I don't know. The roadmap is pretty unclear for each of this, especially with creative pursuits. You know, you talk to creative people and you're like, what do you think my path would be? And they're like, well, it's creative. So like kind of there isn't really a clear path. And you're just right. like, damn. Right. You know, there's even, no template. There's no template. Yeah. And and the higher you get on whatever hierarchy, the less the template even really exists. Mm -hmm. Like people will go, well, okay, if you wanted to be like the best interviewer in the world, probably you'd work for a news station, you'd be a reporter, you'd move up, you'd get your little column, then you'd get maybe your radio show, and then you'd get maybe your TV show, and then dot dot dot, you're kind of like Katie Couric in '94, where she's like the face of this thing, or Brian uh, from what is it, ABC News, or Williams. Something. Brian Williams yeah, yeah. from ABC News mm -hmm. or NBC, which NBC, whichever one. I think, yeah. I think it's NBC. I think it is. Yeah. And then it's like, but then after that, yeah. it's like, well, how do you get from there to like what Larry King is doing? Well, I don't know. He just you become dot 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 cultural icon. I mean, what's that path look like? Is that necessary? Or is that something that happens as a result of doing these other things? Like, you don't really even know. They're stress-related with that as well. And that causes you to resent the fact that you chose the occupation in the first place, too. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's great for... That, that applies, I think, to people who are creating apps and everything. It's just different. It's a different kind of WTF Meaning situation. Meaning is not about happiness. It's about significance. And... If you pursue purposeful work, you will find significance mm -hmm. at, at some level. You will find it more meaningful than whatever other job you didn't love or whatever other situation you left. Like, that's why people pursue their purpose, mm -hmm. uh, at least when they try to turn it into their jobs. They're trying to connect with that significance in their professional lives. But it won't make you happy. Um, 
what does make you happy is a topic, a totally, a, a totally separate topic. And we talk about it here and there. I mean, that's a very personal thing and sure. it's about uh, relationships and mindsets and psychology. It's about a lot of things, but it think it's just important to decouple those two concepts. And it's also important to remember that purpose is not easy. The idea that purpose will be easier than the other thing that wasn't purposeful is part of the problem because then we set ourselves up to be disappointed when the really meaningful work doesn't make it easier to get out of bed or to get excited or to push through when things are hard. I was reading an interview recently with Stacey Schiff, who's a really famous biographer. She writes these beautiful biographies, which is really difficult work at that level. It's basically years of combing through archives looking through documents that nobody else wants oh, to look yeah. at. Like a Walter like, Isaacson type situation. Totally. I'm always like, how do you do that? Why do you do that? I this is a thousand page biography of a guy that lived uh, 400 years ago or more. Like, it, what? It's insane. How? Why? How? And, pain. The pain. The pain of it and the loneliness <laughs> and the alienation and the like. The, I mean, to me, that is one of the like best examples of needle in a haystack. I'm look. I'm imagining s some guy sitting or gal sitting in a basement, musty, of a public library in a remote town because they're the ones that have somewhere maybe in this pile of like card catalogy type looking volumes. Yep. There's maybe some original writing. Da da da. Maybe. Maybe. And probably not. <laughs> yeah. Or it's like a copy of something that's not available because it's in the Vatican archives, which are inaccessible. But you waited 14 years on the waiting list to like get access to this thing, so you're just kind of going there, fingers crossed, and you're going to spend maybe four to five months looking through everything that you can. Yep. Because and, nobody else will. Because right. that's what sets you apart. Because that will is what will make your biography right. the best biography. I mean, it's really intense, lonely work. Yeah. Very purposeful for the people who pursue it, but really difficult. And in an interview with her, she talked. She said this one thing that I'll, I will never forget. She said, "There are delicious days. There are not delicious weeks." Yeah. Yikes. So it took me a long time to accept that reality. Yeah. Um, it can be a tough pill to swallow, especially if you if you left a career the, like we did to to if you left a career you didn't love to pursue one you really do. It's hard to wrap your head around the idea that this might not make you this might not be easier um, just because it's more meaningful right. to you. Discovering that your passion doesn't feel any easier can be pretty scary, I think, and it creates a lot of disturbing thoughts that that frankly, they chip away at your desire to keep going because then you're starting to think about things like, you know, but I'm doing what I love, mm -hmm. right? Like if I can't enjoy this. Like, oh crap, I don't love this all the time. So right. it's either not the right thing for me, right. which is terrifying because then you, like your other options are not on the table. Right. So you're thinking, crap, I got to start up. Or maybe I just can't enjoy it. Maybe I'm broken and I can't enjoy anything. I can't enjoy anything, which right. is an even scarier thought. Right, like not not that I just haven't found it, it doesn't <laughs> exist because I'm effed up. I'm incapable way. of, right. yeah, totally. And if my passion is this hard, is it really my purpose? Right. Like, Shouldn't did it I make... just never, what about that thing that someone's grandpa said one day, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> yeah. like, why doesn't what, that apply to me? Yeah, I haven't found that, so obviously I'm wrong. I mean, these are all normal thoughts. Mm -hmm. I wanna reiterate that, I'm sure, you would agree with me and I want I want to I want to share what I wish I had heard sooner which is that these are all normal thoughts but they're built on a misconception and the misconception is that purpose should be easy all the time it's not in almost every case purpose pursuing your purpose is brutally hard and any craft done well requires a ton of hard work mm -hmm. determination sacrifice all the things we know because it means more to you it means more to you than a traditional job. And because it means more, your purpose will hook into your hope, your happiness, yeah. your sense of self-worth. Yeah, identity. Your identity, it will dictate the quality of your life and it will, it will in, at least in my case, the more you pursue it, it will reveal the depths of your ignorance right. about how hard the craft really is about how much it requires. So it's also really joyful and really, like there's a euphoria and a joy and like this, an indescribable satisfaction that you can get from that kind of work, but that comes not just with, but because of the difficulty of the craft. Yeah, yeah, and I find that the problem is, I've tried to do things like, oh, I'm just gonna do interviews where like I'm not really 
that worried about the outcome or like I'm not the stakes aren't that high and I did that for a long time mm -hmm. but the problem is you don't yeah you, in the moment you might even enjoy it more because you're like oh this is just an enjoyable conversation between me and this person I don't have to worry about my prep notes and I don't have to worry about but then you go mm, probably not my best work right and so then you find yourself going crap when I put it on easy mode it's more fun but then it's not really like the challenge that's there that makes the work the best is gone. And that's kind of annoying. Yeah, that's <laughs> a really real thing you just shared. Yeah. yeah. Like, like if you go on easy mode, you can take a little pressure off yourself, but then you rob yourself of the, yeah. the opportunity, the challenge really to like find out how good this can be when right. I want it to it's go. It's probably right. like how I work out. I go to the gym and I'm like, I'm gonna do this. I'm not gonna go super full heavy, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be okay. done by then. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna be done. Yeah. But somebody who's into fitness, not me, not this guy, <laughs> will go to the gym, and it's like, basically half the time I see these guys that are at these CrossFit boxes and stuff. They're kind of like, how close can I get to just absolutely projectile vomiting or like not able to walk out of here? That's the kind of workout I want, and I'm like. No, not me. But that's what they're there for. That's their That's jam. their thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's why they are there. And then, of course, they're like, come work out with us. And I was like, why would I ever do that? <laughs> yeah. Let's get coffee after you're done if you can stand up straight and like, get yourself a Starbucks. <laughs> and also what you're saying is that, you know, CrossFit is, it full, it occupies a different place in your life than, than what right. it does for that's them, which we'll get into in a moment. Damn but sure, yeah. basically, just to like bottom line this, I think it's important to embrace the difficulty of your purpose if you're going to keep going. Not yeah. to fight it and not to worry that your whole life is going to fall apart when it gets hard, but to embrace the difficulty. And that gives you a few benefits. And just to quickly just appreciate some of them is one of them, it gives you a ton of gratitude for the good days. Yeah. And there will be good days. There's nothing like living with the suck of something to yeah. make you appreciate the days that are fun and inspiring and productive. And if a purpose were not hard, we really wouldn't understand how precious the good days are. I'm sure when you have like when you're in flow on a great interview, yeah. you're like, oh, this I know how good this feels because I've been in all those subpar interviews where I've gone through the muck of like doing the hard prep to get mm -hmm. to this point. It's only by that comparison that you really understand how good the good days really are. Exactly, yeah. It also gives you a ton of appreciation for the craft. And I think this one's even more important if you're gonna stick with purposeful work because you know, people who find their purpose easy most of the time, I think usually don't have a true grasp of what the craft entails. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a, a grasp of what the craft of writing entailed for the first few years. I was just so ignorant about how hard it is because I was just splashing around in the shallows. Yeah, you're like, I can spell and have good grammar. Yeah, right? and I can like string together sentences and sounds okay, yeah. you know? But it's like, hang on, but when you find, when you realize how difficult it is, when, you, when it starts to get painful is usually when you are coming up against the sophistication of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that that appreciation becomes part of why you pursue the purpose because you're like oh i get it i'm trying to do something that's really hard and meaningful and special yeah but i didn't know that until it got hard now that it's hard i get it right it's it's like seven years in and i tell the story a bunch on the show but robert green was like oh you're pretty good at this and i was like me you know and then i was, was really reinvigorated with it and i was like oh i'm gonna like do more work because the reason it was good that episode was because I had read the whole book. And so that upped my game. I was like, well, I'm not, not gonna read the whole book for everyone, but I'm gonna work on the show more. And then later on it was like, well, wait a minute. Every, okay, the truth, the uncomfortable truth is reading the book makes the show better mm -hmm. every single time. Right. So I was like, I just have to now do that. Yeah. And then I went through this other phase where it was like, well, my friend's filming each episode. That's ridiculous. That's like above and beyond. But yeah, you know, when I do film it, it's better because we're there and we're bringing our A game and we're on camera. And I was like, crap. The uncomfortable truth is I got to do these all in person and film them all, all the time. And, re and I've got to read the book. And I've got to like... And then more recently, I'm like, you know, I was... These were more fun when I was funnier. And that was when I was prepped less because I was more off the cuff. And I was like, well, I can't really do less prep, which was a suggestion I got from a lot of people that were... Um, probably not really that great at interviewing per se yeah. or like not in depth in interviewers and they're like I know you I knew you wouldn't like that answer so now I'm like okay well what I'm going to do is get like an improv and comedy coach and be like no I need to be super super well prepared 
but then also be able to just like let that stuff live in one part of my brain and then also be spontaneous and fun in this other part of my brain at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so the uncomfortable truth, again, is I have to work on that skill because people who are just kind of naturally funny, they have done such a crap ton of work at that. They're not just, or they're, they're either on fire and they can only do it occasionally, but the people who are doing it consistently, they're really practiced. They're so prepared that they could be spontaneous. Right, they're yeah, so prepared totally. that it's the stuff that they're prepared for is living in this like automated part of their brain and the funny stuff is happening because they're super present. Yep. That requires a ton of training. Totally. And I'm getting that training now. So it's like, there's all of these, it's kind of like every time you come full circle and you're like, I'm good, you really have to, you gotta throw another five pound plate on there. And at the end of at the end of that process, or at the end of each of those those phases, you were coming into a better understanding of what it means to be a broadcaster, mm -hmm. like to be a true broadcaster, which is that I, I have to be on all the time. I have to be prepared as much as possible for every episode, yeah. and I have to be on camera, and I have to be spontaneous, and I have to be connected, and I have to be present. Right. It's like it's hard to understand the totality of those things until you really right. confront that producing a great interview is really hard. Right, oh and by the way, you have to be able to do that when you haven't slept much, you're tired, you feel like you're probably getting kind of sick, you're super hungry, the caffeine hasn't kicked in yet, and you have to pee. Which is me right now. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. And it, and it gives you resilience, ultimately, yeah. at the end of the day, which is also a topic in and of itself, but resilience doesn't come when purpose is easy, it gets developed, right. that grit gets developed when things are, are hard. Um, I think we should talk a little bit about how to very tactically how to keep going when yes, things are hard. Of course, the practical part that people actually want to learn. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these are no. I think we're talking about a lot of practical stuff, but there is an element of this which is just like, okay, but but how do I deal with it today? It's yeah, worth like, noting. So, so, like they found this today because they're procrastinating because they're in a difficult <laughs> moment of their purpose, yeah. and they're like, oh, maybe this will be a good distraction that I can pretend is relevant. And by the way, now it's going to be relevant. <laughs> well, yeah, totally because. When a purpose becomes hard, it becomes hard on two levels. Mm -hmm. On a day-to-day -day level, it gets difficult to execute, to focus, to produce good work. That's the difficulty of the craft, whatever the craft is, whether it's writing or making a product or building an app, whatever it is. That level of difficulty comes from the technical aspect of pursuing your passion. And overcoming it is just about consistency and learning and improving, uh, just putting in hours. That's the set of concerns, that layer of difficulty is the set of concerns that, that leads to thoughts like, I don't know what I'm doing right now, or I don't like the work right now, or I'm lost, or I'm confused. But on a broader level, purpose also gets difficult on this, on this other layer, which is that it becomes difficult to commit, to keep going, to stay connected to your mission over time. And that's the difficulty of the journey, not the craft, but the journey. And I think that challenge is a lot harder to deal with because it involves like deeper issues of talent and self-worth and like love and passion and whether I have those things. Right, it's like, oh, well, do I even have what it takes to get to the top of the game? Exactly. Or am I just not gonna do, is this, is this, is this all there is? Is this all there is? Did I make a mistake? Like, Did do I, I have enough? Did I waste time. my time? Yeah. Exactly. And unsurprisingly, that difficulty is what leads a lot of people to quit, mm -hmm. ultimately. On the worst days, pursuing your passion gets difficult on both of those levels. So it's hard in the craft and it's hard on the level of the journey. And on those days, it can be almost impossible to keep going. Those are the days when you're like literally throwing your laptop across the room or you're running away to a bar or perhaps a Taco Bell to, yeah. have, <laughs> to, to take a nap. <laughs> to take a nap. <laughs> yeah. um, you once told me that you used to call those your post office days. I th yes, the do you post still office call, do you, days. Yeah, yeah. I don't have them as you much You don't have anymore. as much anymore, but I definitely that's a the, real thing. Yeah, that's yeah. a real thing. So the post office days were, especially with the old company, they happened all the time where it was like, I'd go, you know what, this sucks so much that I would rather work Sorry, US, U.S. Postal Service. I would rather get a job at a place like the post office where my check is guaranteed and I just do the same thing and I'm not so effing stressed all the time and I'm not sitting on a bed because I have one room to do all of my work in and there's no room for a desk, so I'm working from my bed for 18 hours, seven days in a row with, like, no life. You know, those were my post office days. And I, I would literally drive down the road or walk down the road and I'd see construction workers and I was like, they're in the sun, they're going to be done at four. Yeah, they had to get up early, but 
They know what they're going to be doing tomorrow. They probably have health insurance. That's that's dismal for me. Those were horrible. I still have those off days. Now, though, like, Jen will cheer me up or something, you yeah, know, yeah. or, like, I'll call a friend mm -hmm. and they'll, uh, who's also an entrepreneur, and they'll be like, yeah, dude, I'll, everyone has these, you know. And it's it's usually the days where it's like, you've got to be doing legal stuff, and then you're, you got to pay your taxes, and then also you're dealing with a bunch of accounting, and then you've got a thing that canceled that you were looking forward to, and then you're also really tired from the night before. Like, you still have those down days, but... I've just had so many that I realized that they they just pass. Mm. It's not the thing that you're feeling in the moment right then is not like the the true scenario. It's not the true circumstance of your life. That's really important. That's another principle I think we can keep in mind that yeah. like even though in a, in some ways we're saying that purpose gets harder the more you do it. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it also gets easier because you know that there are ebbs and flows right. to a, those feelings. Yeah, like every day where I'm like, man, I'm not looking forward to any of the interviews that I'm doing. I'm not looking forward to any of the prep that I'm doing. And I go, huh, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. What have I eaten today? Okay, not a whole lot. Did I go to the, when's the last time I went to the gym? Eh, okay, it's been like four days. How did I sleep last night? Okay, yeah, let me, let me before I panic and worry about my career being stagnant and over, yep. I'm gonna go work out yeah. and then I'm gonna take a nap. Yep. And then I wake up and I'm like, let's crack at this prep, <laughs> right. I'm ready. Right. Or I'm like, let's play frickin' Xbox, go to bed and start over. Mm -hmm. And then- You have some perspective. I'm good. Yeah, totally. You know, I'm good. So, but before, 10, 15 years ago, I was like, nope, I just made the wrong life choice and I'm gonna end up miserable and broke. Yeah, I had a bad day, so it must be, oh, it's over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my totally. life is over. So, so just to come back to this thing of like, what do you do today? How do you make this tactical? Well, in moments when your purpose gets so hard that it gets hard to keep going, a really powerful technique is to focus on the micro over the macro. And what we mean by that is when you focus on what is in front of you right now, so that could be, I have to read this book for this interview. Right. I have to book that guest for next month. I have to, I have to learn this um, piece of code. I clearly just revealed my ignorance about coding yeah. because I don't know how to code, but I, you know, whatever you have to learn or do or prepare, whatever that, that very specific tactical thing is, when you do that, you force yourself to simply do the next thing and to ignore the more terrifying questions about the bigger picture. Right. Instead of worrying if you have enough to make it as an author, you finish that paragraph. Instead of questioning whether you know the little house you're building, like the extension of your house, will look okay once you finish, you, you just sand that piece of wood. Right. What that does, when you deliberately go small in that way, you create these concrete tasks that short circuit, the paralysis that comes with questioning all of these big things about purpose. That doesn't mean that those questions are irrelevant. It doesn't right. mean that, that you shouldn't ask them. It just means that if your goal is to learn how to keep going, then sometimes the best thing is just to keep going. Right, like force yourself to execute even if you don't feel like it. And, because, and you can compartmentalize that feeling a little bit. Totally. And why does that work? Well, for one thing, going micro forces you to execute even when you don't feel like it, mm -hmm. which of course would be your goal if you weren't experiencing all that doubt and misery. Right. <laughs> so right. by forcing yourself just to do what's in front of you, you short circuit the voice that says, it, it isn't worthwhile, you don't have enough, right. you don't have, you're too tired or whatever. You jump straight to the end game. Yeah. You can't finish this marathon. Look, I'm just going to finish the I'm next gonna mile. I'm just going to finish it, and then yeah. we'll find out. Yeah, maybe I'll walk the rest of it. That's fine. Exactly. It's an option. But I'll, I'll run the next mile, so and then you end up finishing. That's a really clever hack, and it's so simple. And sometimes the fact that it's so simple is what why we doubt that it can work, but it does work in a lot of cases. The other reason, which you just pointed out, is that growing micro forces you to compartmentalize. So it's interesting. The brain, the human brain, has a really hard time doing two significant things at once. Like either it can despair over the bigger picture or it can focus on doing a specific task as well as it can. The deeper you go into the task in front of you, the harder it is for your brain to ruminate on these questions that keep you stuck, mm -hmm. the, the bigger questions about your purpose. Like you'll always be free to return to those questions later if you want to, but you'll probably think a lot differently about them if you've done more of the work for that day. Yeah. So compartmentalization, which is really just a fancy word, I think, for like discipline, for disciplined thinking, will allow you to continue your work even when it gets hard, if you focus on the micro. But the biggest benefit, and I think the most significant one, is that going micro often reconnects you to your purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of 
it's a paradox because you think like, if I have questions, big questions about my purpose, then I should question them and I should try to find answers to them for me to stay connected to what I really want to do. But sometimes it's not about answering the questions. It's about continuing to do the work mm -hmm. that gives you that connection to your purpose again. When you commit to doing the work in front of you, even when you're not sure if it's worth it, you usually rekindle your relationship to your goal, even a little bit. Yeah. It's a lot harder to despair about writing when you're writing. Yeah, it's, it's really hard for me to think about I don't know. Sam Harris has more downloads than me. Like I, that, that's not that common of a of a quip. Uh, but I'll I'll be like, I don't enjoy this. I, no, all my interviews are going to be horrible. If I'm listening to an audiobook and taking notes, like I'm just doing that, exactly. and then often that will just pass. And I, rem I there's a lot of times where I'll make a conscious choice to do that because I'm like, you know, I can spend the next hour thinking about how I'm probably not going to ever be, uh, you know, as have my own CNN show or something, which is, I have no basis for that other than that's how I feel at that time. Sure. Or I can like do the next thing that I have for sure have to do, right? which is like take notes for this next interview yeah, or like go for a walk and make these phone calls. Yep. And one choice is clearly more productive than the other one because mm -hmm. I'm not going to come up with a satisfactory answer, but there is kind of a different, there's got to be people that focus on the micro all the time and then never think about these big questions. Yes. And that's a problem too. That's a problem, and we have to talk about that because there is a line, and I think it's a fine line, a shifting line, between discipline and denial. Yeah. So is there ever a time when we do need to question the bigger picture? You know, like can burying yourself in, burying yourself in the micro ever become a way of just sticking your head in the sand? Right, it and is. Like not wanting to confront the truth, and the answer is yes. But it's a tricky thing because they can look a lot like each other. Yeah. And sometimes you can be very disciplined one day and do your work. And sometimes you can be what looks like very disciplined another day and be totally ignorant of what you need to be asking yourself. One way that I've gotten around this, and I got this from entrepreneur friends of mine, and uh, in particularly Noah Kagan of sumo.com and AppSumo, was he said, make an annual plan. And he wasn't really, I don't know if he was trying to get me to like reconnect to my purpose or whatever, mm -hmm. but he's like, make an annual plan and then just stick to it. And I thought, well, that's really dumb, simple advice, but I thought, you know what? I've never done that because I worked with an old company and they would change everything every five minutes. And then when we started the new one, we didn't have the ability to be like, here's all these things we'd like to do. It was like, get plug the holes in the ship so we can make money, right? Uh, and survive. But this year we made one in January and it was like, cool, am I gonna write a book this year? No. Am I gonna do more YouTube? Yes, so the interviews will go on YouTube. So that means we have to learn videography. We have to get the film kit set up. We have to take lessons on this and da da da. And so we plan everything out, new websites coming soon, new this, new that. Then we went, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, cool, we're gonna have to check in on that every week. Now when someone's like, hey, my agent will call and go, Jordan, how, what, how are we doing on the book front? And I go, it's not going to happen until next year. I've already planned out the whole year. And they're like, all right, I don't love that, but fine. So I don't have to spend excess of cognitive resources going, but there's this shiny object over there. Now sure, if something really compelling happens and it's like, hey, would you want to shoot a pilot for a TV series? You need to block off a week to do it. Sure, yeah. why not? You can still be surprised. I yeah. can still yeah, do yeah. it and be surprised yeah. and, and focus on something like that. However, I'm not going to go, huh, let's change the goals around because I had three hours this weekend at an airport lounge and I decided to change everything. And frankly, I've worked with marketers in the past and other people that I've kind of in part fired because they do that. They'll go, new plan, we're selling this instead, new plan, we're gonna have this kind of funnel. And I'm like, okay, if you're gonna be distracted by that, you're gonna distract the whole team and you're never gonna get anything of, of note done. So it's not a fit, you gotta go. And that's, that's painful, but I see this problem happening a lot. And there is that element of being very tempted to get a new app to plan for your workflow instead of like, doing a freaking practice run or doing the prep work that you have to do. You'll get an app to organize your notes better. So I decide when I do that, when I catch myself doing that, uh, of course the annual plan helps, the weekly me planning meetings that we have here on the team helps, but if I decide to do that, I'll go, cool, I can look at productivity apps at 7 p.m. when I'm done with work, when we're watching Netflix, I can fart around on my iPad and instead of like mindlessly playing Candy Crush or watching Vice News, yeah, I'll look for productivity apps. 
that's when I allow myself the luxury of getting caught up in the details and sort of circle jerking on some minutia that doesn't move the ball forward, right? And most of the time I go, yeah, no really new good apps out there. I'm just going to stick with the Google Docs. Thanks, right? And it, because you, it is very easy and very tempting to go, woof, I've got all this really complex stuff to do. But you know what? They updated this email thing. Why don't I migrate all my email from Google Suite to da da da? Like it's really tempting to do that, and right. I see entrepreneurs and business owners doing this all the time. So what you're talking about is kind of like creating a space and a time to question certain mm -hmm. things, so that the rest of the time you know that you are just there to execute. Right. So discipline is knowing when to think about certain issues. Denial is refusing to think mm -hmm. about them at all. Yes. So when you choose to finish your day's work by focusing on the tasks in front of you, you're being disciplined. When you only focus on your work and you refuse to reflect on the bigger questions you might have about your purpose and your journey, then you might be slipping into denial. Agree, and one of the, one of the things that, was, that really caused us to do the annual plan was I really didn't wanna do it. Mm. And it wasn't like, oh, this is a waste of time. It was, wow, I have to prioritize my entire year? That's kind of terrifying. That's kind of daunting, yeah. Because then I've gotta kind of get married to these ideas of what I'm gonna do, and, and then I have to think about all these really hard things that need and must be done. And then I have to face the idea that like some things are gonna take longer than a year, mm -hmm. and the idea that I'm gonna have to not pursue other things that I really wanna do because there just isn't enough time. Right. I just didn't wanna face that reality. So I finally sat down and was like, that just means I really have to do this. And I did it and it was awesome and powerful. Because that there's, there's a lot of freedom in somebody going, I've got this great thing you should do, and I go, it's not on the annual plan, so I'm gonna say no, I don't even have to think about it. Really. Yeah, yeah, no, I see that. And, and I wonder if maybe another thing that was, was kind of hard about it was like, knowing that if you were disciplined in that way, you wouldn't have a reason to avoid doing the work every other moment of your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you're like, I'm gonna quarantine those big questions to this practice. It's an annual thing and a weekly check-in, and that's it. Right. That's our time to talk about the bigger stuff. Without that in place, you might have been thinking about that every day. You might mm -hmm. have been thinking about it every couple hours. That might have been easier or felt easier to you. It, it is, and you second-guess yourself, and you go, well, I'm going to do this instead. But then when you've committed in January, mm -hmm. yeah. and your team's been working on stuff, yeah. you go, well... It's not, this is what we've decided to do. There isn't any, there's no backseas on this right, stuff. Right. Unless it's like, okay, this just didn't work. It didn't work, that's or, a different you know, thing. It's ROI right. negative, it's flushing money down the toilet, we're stopping right. it. But I'm not gonna like throw a bunch of stuff in there and be like, eh, just pause this other thing because it's less exciting. Yeah, yeah. Making execution a commitment on the day to day and then carving out a, a practice or, or a time. Yes. Um, whether it's like an hour a week or it's an annual goal setting thing or whatever to reflect on the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really important. Another important thing is, and this one's really obvious, but I think it's really worth exploring is that sometimes we just have to remember why we're pursuing our purpose in the first place. In the early days of pursuing your purpose, you're so connected to the journey, like to the mission. Right because you just left whatever you were doing before, it's the early days, you're thinking about it constantly. So your exuberance about that will sustain you through the difficulty of the early days. Um, for me at least, that was kind of like a fuel that protected me against frustration and boredom. But over time, that excitement naturally wanes. You lose that buffer, I think. You don't have as much raw hope and pure enthusiasm because as we keep talking about, it gets hard, right? And the day-to-day -day grind of the goal can usually eclipse the bigger reason that you were pursuing the goal in the mm -hmm. first place. And once that happens, it's, it's really crucial to take a step back and remember why you're pursuing your purpose in the first place. Yeah. I think if I asked you that right now, you would take a moment and you would just come back to a very simple thing that I've seen in you and I see in your show, which is like, I really need to understand why people do what mm -hmm. they do. I love dissecting the playbooks of people who are at the top of their field. Like, mm -hmm. that is your purpose. That is what binds you to this show. That simple childlike obsession with a deeper mission is at the core of every good purpose, but it gets obscured. I think it gets covered over, yeah. it, gets, it, gets, it gets lost. 
really, yeah. in the day-to-day -day of everything. And the yeah. harder it gets, the more it gets lost. You, and you hear about this from successful people all the time, where they'll, they'll start some... Uh, example would be like they start some restaurant and then other restaurant owners are like wow your restaurant's so successful and they're like oh yeah I do online marketing and then they shift to online marketing for restaurants and they're doing it and they're really successful and they're making all this money and they're like I hate this and everyone's like what are you talking about why and they're like I liked cooking food and yeah. having people eat it and like being around that environment yeah. now I'm like in an office yeah. with 17 team members doing like IP and like IP contracts and visual marketing assets for someone's new Yelp launch like F this it's How so, did I end up here? It's like you ended up here because you pursued the thing you cared about But right. once it became successful it took you far further away from from that core, right? That's hard I remember hearing and this this might be a, a bad example in this day and age, but it's it's actually a really meaningful one I remember hearing that several years ago Mark Zuckerberg would try to carve out I want to say an hour, but I doubt it was an hour But he would try to carve out time every day to do a little coding. Oh, yeah Zuckerberg is not coding today. No, he's dealing with some more serious issues that he has to deal with as the CEO of this incredibly complicated company But I'd say what got him into Facebook in the first place was that he loved coding mm -hmm. like he was an engineer but Zuckerberg is not an engineer anymore. He's yeah. a CEO, right? and I'm sure he has his own ways of staying connected to it. He talks a lot in interviews and, and public statements about connecting up the world and you can poke holes in that and you can question whether he means it and you can question whether Facebook is, is really still doing what it was designed to do originally. But I, I bet, I'd be willing to bet that part of the reason he talks about that so much is almost to remind himself of what he's here to do because if he didn't have a connection to that purpose, to that mission, why would you deal with all of the pain and frustration right. other than the fact that he can't walk away which is right, yeah, <laughs> a powerful that. motivator there's and there's a lot of money at stake obviously these are huge parts of the equation but but really on a day-to-day -day level if that guy were not committed or didn't at least choose to be committed to that deeper mission the whole thing would fall apart yeah or he yeah. would be miserable every second of the day which who knows maybe he it's is possible it's but possible you but also he would see, be more miserable if he weren't you see a lot of silicon valley type people doing things like oh i'm going to cure every disease well that's great and lofty and is good pr but i think what it also is is hey this whole connecting the world thing and carving down time every day to code it's not really doing so much and eventually people won't care about any of this but they'll probably always remember the guy who cured every disease and that's far more interesting than trying to acquire like whatsapp data yeah so yeah. maybe i'll focus on that a couple hours a week and like achieve a new purpose or new meaning um, and when you lose sight of your deeper motivation you can always return to that activity or other activities that will help reconnect you one that I do a lot is talk to somebody and mm, be like yeah. okay what's going on am yeah. I crazy yeah. am I a big failure you know make me feel good about myself <laughs> you know, somebody, uh, I, I would argue stuff. Jordan that it's not just about making me feel better no. it's about giving giving somebody some space to to articulate out loud mm -hmm. what it is why it is that they're doing what they do we've had those conversations yes. like when we feel disillusioned or stuck I think we used to like sit with those feelings and just internalize them oh yeah because you would be you know maybe for good reasons you're like well this isn't other people's job this is my job you know but of course that just makes it worse mm -hmm. like I, I began in my case I began to doubt whether I was really cut out to pursue my passion all because I assumed that I had to stay connected to my purpose on my own but over time, you start to realize that it's really helpful. There's also a part of this that can be indulgent and can take you away from your work, and that's a different thing. But if you're doing it in the right way, in a disciplined way, it's really helpful to discuss your work with someone else. And yeah. when you do that, when you articulate your motivation for doing something to someone else, you're able to revive that motivation for yourself. You have to almost hear it out loud and have somebody reflect it back to you, to mirror it back to you when you can't mirror it back to yourself. So now when when you get lost or frustrated, I notice that you do book time with a friend. Yeah, I try to do the same, and you ask them for some space to explore your reasons for doing it because you need to remember. You yeah, need exactly. to remember. The other thing you can do, which is another version of this, is to write about it. And writing about it is kind of the same as talking to a friend, but the difference is that the, the hard surface you're coming up against is not another human being, but the page. And in some ways, it can be more helpful because you can sort of have some stream of consciousness sort of right. writing experience, and you can you can 
talk yourself through it, but you also create an objective record of your motivations and your reasons, which you can come back to. Some people find this like really, really helpful. They have a journal. Sometimes they even have certain documents that almost like a, a mission statement for themselves. It's kind of nice because a conversation can fade into memory, but a piece of writing can stay and yeah. you can reread it um, over time. And ultimately what that does is it lets you track your story. And that narrative of why you de- decided to do something in the first place is what can get lost when the purpose gets hard. When you lose your connection to your purpose, it's usually because you've lost sight of the larger narrative, mm-hmm. your story of why you decided to pursue your purpose. And it's important to see how that story is unfolding when things get tough. And of course, what we can do when things start to unravel, or if they start to unravel, is we can recalibrate our purpose as well. One of the ways in which we can recalibrate our purpose is to pivot, right? We've talked about this on the show before. You might you might need to do something else that's sort of tangentially related to this. And you and I were talking pre-show. It, we've done whole shows about this, but... Um, You see media companies do it, you see app companies and tech companies do it, but a lot of people do it in their own career where they're like, you know, I love, I love the food thing and I love the writing thing, but it's just not working for me. And it's like, okay, well, maybe you need to write fiction and you need to do other things with food that that create that same level of, maybe you don't need to be a food blogger. Right. Or maybe you like eating a bunch of different stuff and making content about it, but maybe YouTube is not really where it's gonna be for you. Like, you don't like the video element. You like eating and talking about it. Maybe you do need to be a food blogger yes. instead of a videographer yeah, or a totally. YouTuber, right? So there's there's these little shifts that you can have. Yeah, pivoting in your purpose means that you're connected to the right source of meaning, but you're going about it in the wrong way. Right. So you love writing and you wanna say something original, but you're not meant to write a novel, that's okay. You're meant to edit a magazine or to write a newsletter in your company right. or to explore your writing in another form. Mm-hmm. And that can actually get you closer to your purpose by stepping away from the form that you were so attached to. You can also just not do it anymore. <laughs> That's also not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know quitting is like not cool these days because you got to push through everything. Hashtag hustle. Hashtag never give up. Hashtag follow your passion. Right. But sometimes uh, you should not do that at all. And sometimes those facetious hashtags are garbage. I'm glad you're bringing it up because I know it's a bit of a buzzkill to talk about this and that's why so few people talk about it, but it would be irresponsible not to talk about it because if you pursue a purpose that isn't correct, it's not right for you for whatever reason, that is no way to live a life. It doesn't make sense to produce a ton of unhappiness or to stick with an idea of what your purpose is instead of finding out what your real purpose is. That doesn't serve anybody. Yeah. So, and honestly, so many of the episodes that that you that you've produced with amazing people, they've talked a lot about quitting. Yes. They've talked about, yeah, I had to put that down and the moment I put it down, I opened up space and time in my life to find out what else I should be doing and that's how I found the product I was supposed to build. Exactly. But they wouldn't have found it if they didn't give it up. So, another thing we can do is shift priority and I know a lot of people talk about this where they'll be like Oh yeah, you know, I, I'm gonna quit podcasting uh, if I don't start making money doing it. And I'm like, how long have you been doing it? Oh, like six months or or a year or ten years, whatever. And I'm like, maybe it doesn't need to be your job. Maybe this is a hobby that pays for one of your vacations each year, and that vacation is to the podcast movement or whatever, right? Podfest. You know, that that's maybe it's your cool hobby that you kind of wish was your occupation, but right now. You're stressing because you can't pay rent. You've got 18 different podcasts because you need the revenue and you're consulting, but you don't like that because you gotta da da da. Maybe you should teach other people how to do the tech setup and you should work for the hosting company or whatever and you should do this other thing that you also enjoy and stop ruining your favorite thing by trying to make it your job, right? If you love creating videos and putting them up on YouTube, it doesn't mean you have to be an influencer and make your living off AdSense or revenue or come up with an info product to sustain you. It might just be something you do that you're known for that is a hobby and doesn't end up paying for your mortgage. Again, most people don't like to talk about that because it sounds a lot like quitting. And it's unsexy. But it's unsexy, but it's actually quite the opposite because if you shift the priority of your purpose, you often find a way to hang on to it. You protect it. Mm -hmm by giving it the correct place in your life. Exactly. You preserve the joy that the project brought you by not forcing it to become something that it shouldn't. Exactly. So where does that leave us? I mean, look, 
at the end of the day, it's really it's a really important part of pursuing your purpose to embrace that it is not always easy, that it doesn't automatically make you happy. Right. And as unsexy and sad as it can be, the more you pursue a purpose that really means something to you, the more you are going to find it difficult and confusing and demoralizing. But once you realize that that's part of the package, something else opens up, and that's something you don't hear a lot about. And that's that struggle exists whether you pursue meaningful work or not. Meaningful work is often the hardest of all, but after 15 years basically of doing this, I know that you've found that the best strategy is not to deny or minimize the pain of it, but to make meaning out of it. And when you find significance in the struggle, and I, I know this has been true for me, when you find significance in the struggle, you actually create an opportunity to create even more significance if you use it to teach you more about what you're trying to do and why. That's right. Meditate on that, grasshoppers. Gabriel, thank you so much. Man. My pleasure.